Hello viewers and thank you very much for joining us on a brand new season of The People Show. Now, in this show, as always, we bring you inspirational, educative and also motivating stories of real people who have walked different journeys in this same life. Today in studio we have with us a very special guest. Actually, the guest we have in studio today with us is going to talk to us about a very interesting topic. That's the other bit of his life. And it's a topic that most of you probably know or have a hint about, but then you've never paid attention to understand this topic. Or maybe you've thought it's so difficult, I don't want to deal with it. But then that will come in the second part of our show right now. Let me invite our guest to speak to us. Karibu Bwana Benjamin. Thank you, Timothy. Habari ya leo. Mzuri sana. Now, Benjamin Arunda. Who is yes. Benjamin Arunda? Benjamin Arunda is a young Kenyan who has lived a life that, uh, like any other Kenyan, let me say so, mm -hmm. because there's nothing unique uh, in Kenya that uh, maybe can distinct me from any other Kenyan mm -hmm. that has grown up in Kenya. Uh, I've grown up mostly in Kisumu. Uh -huh. Then uh, for the last decade, mm -hmm. I've grown up in Nairobi. All right. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that is when uh, I began part of my college uh -huh. year. Uh -huh. So I am a graduate of the University of Nairobi All right. and uh, continuing right now at Strathmore University, uh -huh. professional level. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's part of my education. Uh -huh. But other than that, mm, I have done a number of things right. in terms of uh, community projects before, mm -hmm. yes, uh, that have also given me skills mm -hmm. on how I can work with community and given me new knowledge yes. on uh, what the society needs that I can contribute to. Oh. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, you know, I also grew up about four years in Kisumu. Yes. <laughs> That's Kisumu town. Yeah. I also did four years in my rural area, which is not very far from Kisumu town itself. But then how was it like growing up in Kisumu? In what kind of an environment did you grow up in Kisumu? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I grew up just, I don't know what I can put it like, but uh, I can say in an environment where there are no adequate tools, to live out my life. Mm -hmm. In an environment where you know your purpose, but you can't live it out. Wow. You lack adequate tools. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the kind of environment that I lived in, in Kisumu. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I can't say that Nairobi is any much better than Kisumu, mm -hmm. because uh, the tools that I'm talking about are not necessarily physical tools. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> but these are tools that are comes from the leadership, the kind of leadership that you get, yes. the kind of mentorship that you have. Mm -hmm. yeah, these are the things that are, I call tools because if, if you have adequate tools around you mm -hmm. of this kind, yes. then you are able to grow and thrive in any environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe according to your own observation, yes. do you think the environment then, which you grew up in, and what young people who are at the age that you are in when you're growing up at this time in the same environment. Is it the same environment or are there any kind of maybe changes that you can point out or is it still the same to you? Uh, that is in Kisumu? Yep. Okay. I can say that um, there have been a few changes, mm -hmm. but not significant. All right. The few changes, many of them, are, for instance, the penetration of internet, yes. penetration of, uh, of uh, electricity. Right. Yeah. Uh, Electricity was not wide, widely, widespread like as it is right now. Uh, internet was not everywhere like it is today. Like it is today. Yes. yes. But today so we can access it in our phones. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this accessibility yes. is what makes it different. All right. Yeah, because I remember those days in Kisumu, mm -hmm. I could walk uh, several, uh, some kilometers before I can access a cyber cafe. Cyber cafe yeah. And uh, in my life, mm -hmm. In my life, uh, if I now look at my life in Nairobi, yes. I've lived most of my life uh, get, getting uh, my skills on the, on the inter via the internet, mm -hmm. uh, working on the internet. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I try to imagine how I would have managed it in Kisumu then without, without internet. Mm -hmm. Going to cyber would be 
more expensive, yes, and yes, it yes. wasn't really ex uh, accessible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, when we talk about this, uh, there's a, a question that rises at the back of my head. Mm -hmm. Did that, growing up in such an environment, uh, back at home, was there any encouragement or any promise of something much better than what you know the society out there or the environment could give you from maybe close family members yes there is there is a reason why i think i managed to come this far mm -hmm. because uh, i can only look stand on the shoulders who've gone ahead yes. for me to be able to to see All right. the future yes yes i had a good uh, I was surrounded by members of family who have gone ahead of me mm -hmm. and who are inspirational right. in their decision making mm -hmm. and in their achievements right. and in the morality that, that they shown that they lived. Mm -hmm. So I can say for a fact that I had people around me I could look up to. Mm -hmm. I had people around me who could teach me. I had people around me who embraced reading. All right. Yes, All right. uh, who mm -hmm. reading culture was. Mm -hmm ingrained in them at right. a younger age. All right. And so I can say that uh, to, a, to a great extent, I was inspired by people around me, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a few, yes. Uh -huh. Every time I ask that question, yes. I can see. I can see how I grew up, mm -hmm. yes. I, I can see how I was corrected mm -hmm. by these people. Mm -hmm. Being a last one in a big family, <laughs> When I was growing up, my father was already uh, retired. Oh. Yes, my mother retired. All yes, right. so, so as a young boy, <laughs> yes, I can say that my siblings, my cousins, mm -hmm. these were like my parents in oh. a way. Yeah. yeah, they taught me certain things that probably my parents could couldn't have taught me. Right. Yeah, so growing up, I've learned a lot from them. Mm -hmm. And not just when I was in Kisumu, yeah. but even when I came to Nairobi, yeah. there has been, a, a, let me say, um, a breadth of learning mm -hmm. from them and sharing. All yes. Right. All right. Yes. Now, fast forward. Mm -hmm. The decade that you've lived in Nairobi. Yes. That's college and a little bit of work, I guess, as yeah. well. Yeah. What has that been like to you? Nairobi has been both interesting, let me say both sweet and sour, uh -huh. yes, and uh, that's not unique because that's what it is to almost everybody in Nairobi, yes. except you're born in a, with a silver spoon, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, that's life. Uh -huh. And what has made me like Nairobi is that uh, being a 24-hour economy, yes. I've had more opportunities, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, being the capital city, yeah. yes, just the same way we used to consider it when you were in the rural that I want to go to Nairobi and get more opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, there is some aspect of truth in this. All right. Yeah, because um, so many companies have been con concentrated in Nairobi. In Nairobi, yes. Government offices. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, my life in Nairobi since I came in Nairobi, since I started college, mm -hmm. has been one that is full of, uh, full of learning and uh, new experiences. Mm -hmm. We've made friends with people maybe I never imagined I would make friends all with. Right, all right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And key to maybe my life in Nairobi is about survival. All right. What about survival? I mean, there's this thing about survival that everybody keeps mentioning when you talk about living in Nairobi. Yes. What is your experience? <laughs> yes, so uh, you see in Nairobi, mm -hmm. At the beginning, when you're starting your career, yeah. you have to find survival tactics. All right. Yes. Uh -huh. One, we are living in a, in a city where rents are really high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to survive as a Com student. Compared, uh, compared to other to, regions. Compared so. to other towns, yes. of course. Yeah. And even uh, Africa-wide. Right. Nairobi is considered to be a uh, really expensive in terms of rent. All right. Yeah. So living in such a place, okay. Uh, but I can, I can, I can of course say that I got a lot of support from my brothers. All right. But uh, I look at how I survived in college, in terms of uh, you, you, you have to pay your fare, yes. 
you get you have to survive among other students mm -hmm. who probably are coming from wealthier More families wealthier or family, so. Mm -hmm. But this didn't make me feel low or didn't make me feel like uh, I'm so much different from them. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I still went on and performed well. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm not saying these experiences to give somebody an excuse All right. of uh, maybe saying that this is the reason why I failed mm -hmm. or this is the reason why this happened. Yeah, this happened yeah. These are things that are, uh, you see, such challenges sometimes, mm -hmm. everybody have a challenge, mm -hmm. but challenges sometimes, especially in Africa, we see them as challenges. Uh -huh. But in some places, they're seen as opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, Many of the skills that I've gained on the internet uh -huh. came as a result of the challenges I was going through. Uh -huh. For instance, uh -huh. when I started online writing, All right. which at some point was a great source of income for me, yes, yes, uh -huh. it was because I was looking for an option to survive. I was looking, yeah, I wanted extra you income to, pay your bills to survive, to pay my bills, to be able to move around, yes. to grow my career. Yes, yeah, So I realized that there are these massive, uh, uh, there the, the are massive information yes. on the internet. Yes. There's a lot that you can learn on the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I decided to do a lot on the internet. Right. And I've not just done writing, mm -hmm. I've done Forex. Oh, yes. On the internet. On the internet. Uh -huh. So <laughs> these, these are things that helped me survive in Nairobi. All right. Yeah. I, I, I would like to make this more personal, make it uh, a bit more personal. Would you mind sharing with me, or with our viewer at home, mm -hmm. one of the experiences that you went through while in college, in those early days as you were starting, that you still vividly remember, but maybe given a chance, you wouldn't want to go back there. <laughs> there. <laughs> Anything. That is interesting. And Whenever you mention that, the first thing that comes to mind is how I used to survive in terms of transport. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I used to have like 100 shillings every day uh -huh. for my transport. I was okay. living in Omoja estate oh, okay. in Ako. Mm -hmm. And 100 shillings, mm -hmm. this 100 was to take me to University of Nairobi to and fro. And okay. inside that 100 is lunch. So it's 100 bob for transport and lunch. For lunch, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, you have to be, okay. you have to be wise. You have to. I don't know even which time to use there. <laughs> but it was interesting. Sometimes I could manage mm -hmm. well. Just go to school, and I used to. I used to be a group discussion leader. Mm -hmm. So I used to lead like let me say at a group of ten <coughs> in discussions mm -hmm. in preparation for exams, mm -hmm. pre preparations for cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes I realize during that lunch break. As the rest are going for lunch, I tell them I want to hang around. I have a lot of work. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> but then I know the truth. That there is not I, if I eat, I won't be able to go back home. Yeah. Yes. And I also remember times when you didn't eat. You, sk you skipped lunch yes. to save fare. Yeah. But then you still go to the, you still, in the evening, you go to the stage. Mm -hmm. And you realize mm -hmm. that fare is double what you have in your pocket. So then you have to sit there for like, one or two hours mm -hmm. and wait for the fair to, to, come to come down. So for me, that was not, it, it was not a period that I, I struggled with. Yes. It is a period that I, let me, I was patient in, mm -hmm. yes, because I knew what I wanted, mm -hmm. yes. Sure. But it, is, it wasn't easy, mm -hmm. it wasn't easy. But I didn't, I didn't go crying out or I didn't seek sympathy, mm -hmm. yeah, but it wasn't easy. And uh, for a fact, somebody who is in school, you know, most, needs support. most most students wouldn't really have that kind of a patience. Yes. Most students will always want someone to complain to, or will, you know, involve themselves in some dubious ways and you know deals to just get that extra coin in their money. But then, one thing I've also personally observed mm -hmm. of myself and also of the environment is that. Mostly people go astray when they lack some kind of mentorship and also some, someone to maybe drive them or inspire them or someone they look up to who would once in a while or 
probably every time talk to them and show them, hey, you're not supposed to do this. Hey, you're supposed to be patient. Hey, you're supposed to remain you know, focused. Mm -hmm. Did you have anyone like this in your life during that period when you're going through your studies at the, Nairobi, at the University of Nairobi? I want to answer that question, starting from what I experienced when, uh, just before I joined college. Yes. Uh, you see, uh, I can't say that I was always just this perfect boy. Yes. Yes, there were times when I didn't have focus. There were times when I didn't have this purpose. I didn't know my purpose. Yes. Yes, and uh, I had this wandering. I didn't know, I didn't have much focus in what I put mm -hmm. in my studies mm -hmm. and all that. But my greatest inspiration, mm -hmm was when I discovered my, that I have a purpose. Yes. And uh, there was a book I was reading by Dr. Miles Munro uh -huh. way back then. All right. And that's when I discovered that if you have purpose, you are like a mother who is about to give birth. Uh -huh. You're like a pregnant mother. Yes. So what does that mean? You are taking care of the unborn. The unborn. You are careful about what you eat. Yes. You are careful about where you go. Mm -hmm. You don't just go anywhere. Sure, sure. You don't just eat, drink anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, so when I realized that, then I started being careful about my friends. Mm -hmm. Started being careful about which books I read. All right. Started being careful about uh, where I go. Mm -hmm. And that was, yes, I had people around me that were, could guide me and could help me. Yes. But for me, I count that day when I discovered my purpose, the best day because if you don't have a control inside you, yes. an external force cannot control you. Okay. Yes. If you don't have a control inside of you, an external force cannot control you. Cannot control you. Okay. Yes. That's deep. I mean, sort of. And uh, coming from you, of course, you now, mm -hmm. having found the focus, but then you then discovering that and abiding and living by that. Uh, I would also like to discuss uh, more mm -hmm. as, we int as when I was doing the intro for the show. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that you also are now involved in this you know, topic that to many people today, it's still a mystery. And it's also this, you know, only computer geeks can understand this and it's a technical industry. But then uh, I would also like to ask, how did it come towards the tail end mm -hmm. that you, uh, you now began to write? When did that occur to you that I want to, do, I want to write a book? Yes. Of course you mentioned that you did online writing. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I can say that f from the time I was in high school, mm -hmm. I used to have a friend uh, that we used to share poems with. We used to write poems yes. and short stories. Oh, so you did that in school? That before. was in high school. Mm -hmm. We actually had a vision that we'll write a book together. All right. It was a big <laughs> fiction book. We had this big vision of uh -huh. story. And uh -huh. uh, due, due to some dynamics, it didn't come through. Uh -huh. Yes. He's still around? You, you, he's not around? No, you he's, guys he's, he's a graduate meet? from... No, we, we don't meet. <laughs> we don't meet. We, the last time we met, maybe three or four years ago. Uh -huh. Yeah. So chances of writing this comic book together? Mm, I don't know because uh, <laughs> because I also and I will explain that as I move on. Uh -huh. In 2011, mm -hmm. that's when I, f I wrote my first book right. and completed. Uh -huh. This is a fiction, a fiction, a fiction book. Yes. Uh -huh. Once I completed this fiction, I read it through again uh -huh. and realized that uh, because by the time I was writing, I was also reading a lot of books. All right. Yes, I was reading books by. Uh, a, a book on Obama, uh, many topics, mm -hmm. Dr. Miles Munro, mm -hmm. George Vawa, No Turning Back. Yeah. So these books really inspired me. Okay. And then I asked myself a question. Yes, I, I like writing, mm -hmm. but I wanted to write something that could change someone's life. All right. Yes. Not just fiction. Not just fiction, not just story. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I liked fiction mm -hmm. and I like movies. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> but I wanted to write something mm -hmm. that once somebody completes reading it, it can turn around that man's life. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then mm -hmm. I wrote my first book, my other book, mm -hmm. in 2011. That's tw same 2011. I wrote the second book. Uh, another fiction? No. Mm -hmm. Now I, away from fiction, mm -hmm. I wrote another book on change. 
on change. Yes. I want you to hold that thought. I want us to take a short break. And then when we come back after the short break, I would like us now to talk more into this world of writing that you've engaged into. And, you know, from the book about change and then currently what you're doing. Viewers, if you are just joining us, you're watching The People Show. And this is a brand new season of The People Show. Today with us in studio, a very special guest, Mr. Bernard Arunda, an author. And also, he is an uh, ambassador for the Dash Kenya. Dash Kenya. And we are talking about his life. But then we take a short break and we'll be right back after this. Welcome back. If you are just joining us, you're watching The People Show, a brand new episode of the show, of course, that we bring you this year. And in studio today, we have with us a very special guest, as I introduced him earlier, Mr. Benjamin Arunda. Benjamin Arunda is an author and is also the Dash Kenya ambassador. We've been talking to Mr. Arunda, who shared with us the first bit of his story, of course, where he grew up, how he grew up, and today. He also shared with us one interesting bit that I will quote, and then we continue with that, Ms. Sarunda. You say that what gave you focus in life is the theory of focus, to find your focus in life is like a pregnant woman who is thinking about the unborn baby. They mind what they eat, where they go, yes. and what they do. And that actually helped you figure out what you wanted to do, the kind of people you wanted to hang around. You mentioned something about writing. Now, you've written your comic. Mm -hmm. Did you sell? <laughs> no. You didn't sell? I didn't sell. Oh, <laughs> quite unfortunate. But then you now wrote a second book about change. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. OK. so. Um, I mentioned that I wrote about the comic, and I didn't actually I didn't publish. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the second book on change that oh. was in 2011. All right. With my mind then, uh -huh. yes, with my mind then, and with the information that I had then, yes, yes. So I continued uh, going through this book. Mm -hmm. After every few months, I go through the book. Mm -hmm. Then I, at some time, at some top, at some point, I realized that I undercovered certain topics. All right. Yes, so then I, I had to redo a big chunk of it. All right. Yes, the book is still there, mm -hmm. not published yet. Not published. But it will be published. All right. Yes, but then I got a motivation. Mm -hmm. I went to do programming at Moringa School. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So after doing programming, and prior to doing programming, I had this thing on, the, on, on Instagram. Mm -hmm going about Bitcoin, right. cryptocurrency. I was wondering, what is this? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I decided that let me, let me find out. Mm -hmm. Then I had a conversation with my brother mm -hmm. one morning. Mm -hmm. And I asked him about, what is blockchain? Mm. I, did, I actually asked him, what is Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? I asked him, what is Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. But then that question led to blockchain. All right. yeah, so it gave me a small expan explanation about what blockchain is. Mm -hmm. And after that, <laughs> it was like a spray. It was a floodgate of... <laughs> yes, it was like a spray. I went into a, a, a research spree, or sort of. All right. I went into the internet, searched, studied several hours, wake up early, All right. do serious research. Okay. Then I came up with this topic. Mm -hmm. I realized there is a topic that is changing several almost all industries. Mm -hmm. And it is a topic that has a real solution All right. that the world has been looking for. Okay. But then there was no book about it. There was no book, a simple book. I wanted to understand it simply. I wanted to explain to people simply. All right. But there was no material uh -huh. to explain for people uh -huh. simply what this technology is uh -huh. and how it can help them. Right. Yeah, so then I decided, as a writer, mm -hmm. let me take on this task, challenge. Let me take on this task. And um, it took me several months, about eight months. Eight months. About eight months. All right. Sitting down, doing research, 
putting the writing it uh, topic by topic. All right. Then it moved now to the next level, editing and all that. Mm -hmm. Up to what we have and now, we have a product. Now, if you're, if you're just watching at home, I don't know if my camera person can zoom into this. The book that Benjamin is introducing to us right now is this book right here, Understanding the Blockchain. And I understand, Benjamin, that this is the only book in Africa that is explaining in that simple language about the blockchain. Yes, that is true, Timothy. Uh, when I was looking for a book, I actually searched online because I wanted to buy a book mm -hmm. that can explain for me what blockchain is and take me through in a more systematic and simplified way. Mm -hmm. Because blockchain being a technology, not everybody is in technology. Yes. I wanted a book that could help me understand, because I've not done computer science, All right. although I'm a programmer. All right. So my, my computer, uh, my, my skill in computer science is not as sophisticated as somebody who has a background in computer science. Okay. Yes. So I wanted a book that is a little bit simple. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would help me. So as I advanced myself in programming, then understood many of these topics, mm -hmm. took a course uh, in a uh, certified blockchain expert from right. um, the Blockchain Council, right. took a course from the University of Nicosia mm -hmm. to understand digital currency. Right. Then I understood this technology. Uh -huh. Then I decided there is no material in Africa uh -huh. that can explain this thing simply, industry by industry, in a simplified way that anybody, whether in education, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whether you are just a high school graduate, All right. whether you're just in college right now, mm -hmm. you can understand blockchain through this book. So maybe you can just very briefly, because of course I've read a little bit, not everything in the book, <laughs> but then the introduction bit really mesmerized me because personally, even to me, it was that huge, computer science thing that was difficult to understand. Yes. But then maybe if you can just share with us a little bit of the introduction bit in a very simplified manner. Explain to our viewer what this blockchain is all about. Um, let me start with internet. Yes. Many of us understand that uh, before internet came, when you wanted to communicate to somebody, mm -hmm. maybe in a far country, yes. several miles away, the only option was write a letter. Yes and use post-mail. Mm -hmm. So for years, and before that, you, you, you know the history. Yes. It used to be smoke <laughs> and, and all smoke that, and drums, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So when internet came, mm -hmm. internet bridged the gap of distance. Yes. Distance was a huge problem mm -hmm. for us, for humanity. For communication. Yes. For communication, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So internet bridged this gap. Mm -hmm. How? Right now, if you want to communicate to somebody, you could just Send Skype. a WhatsApp, <laughs> Skype. Or Skype, yeah. Yes, it doesn't matter where they are on, mm -hmm. the, on the planet. Yes. You, could, you can talk to somebody in a matter of seconds. Yes. You can link up to somebody. Mm -hmm. You can send information. Mm -hmm. That is because internet came. came in. yes. yes. So then, after internet came, there's a problem that came again. And this problem has been there for a period of time. Mm -hmm. The problem of distrust. Distrust. Distrust, yes. Mm -hmm. You see, dealing with humans, mm -hmm. we are emotional beings. Yes. And as emotional beings, mm -hmm. there can be some aspect of dishonesty. Yes. There can be some aspect of distrust. distrust. Yes, and talking of distrust, how do you trust, for instance, if you send me money, mm -hmm. if I tell you to send me money yeah. to my phone, mm -hmm. how do you trust, how do I trust you when I receive that message, I've received maybe 10,000 from Timothy. Mm -hmm. How do I believe that this is not just a message and this is money? And this is money. Yes, not yeah. just a message. Sure. Major, the, the ones <laughs> we receive from... Yeah, from... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> from committee yes. and, you know, and, so <laughs> and all those, those funny places. Yes, some, yeah. those funny places. Yeah. How do I trust that mm -hmm. Timothy have sent me money? Uh, oh, now I understand. These messages that come like... Your pesa tuma a message comes and then someone calls you asking yes. you to reverse money. Yes, somebody ah. can send you a message. Definitely. That, yeah. Hey, you have received this. this he puts a reference number, some fake yes, reference yes, number. Yes, yes, yes. You've received twenty thousand. Ah, yes. Yes, from mm -hmm. this this number. Mm -hmm. eh? If I receive it, 
with the title and the sender is M-Pesa, I believe you it. You believe it, yeah. But if I receive it and the sender's name is a number a or number. just another name, I don't believe it. Why? Exactly, yes. Because we trust M-Pesa as an institution, mm -hmm. as an intermediary, standing between us to bridge that gap of trust. Okay. Because even though you may know me personally, mm -hmm but you may not trust me that much, yeah, I and I may not trust person. you that much <laughs> that you send me a message and I believe it's money. Yes. Because the problem, now coming to blockchain, the problem that blockchain solves is the problem of distrust. Right. It bridges the gap of trust. Okay. Bridging the gap of trust, there's this term in computer science called the Byzantine generous problem. All right. In a simple way, this problem is where there were generals in a battlefield, mm -hmm. and these generals uh, communicate, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. For them to attack an enemy, mm -hmm. they have to communicate. And they act on information they receive from one another. One another yes. yes, so assume that all of us mm -hmm. are generals. Yes. I tell you, attack. Mm -hmm. And then I withhold and watch you attack. Mm -hmm. What would happen? Chances are that you could be killed I by could enemy. Be killed, yeah. Yes. Definitely. So then if I tell you, if you don't trust me, mm -hmm. and I tell you attack, you will withhold. And look at me, am I really also attacking or I'm waiting? Yeah. So then there is a problem of trust. There's a problem of uh, trusting the information that is coming from a central authority. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in money, it is called a double spending problem. Double spending problem. Yes, whereby when you send me that message that mm -hmm. I received this money from Timothy, yes you can decide before I spend it. Mm -hmm. You've already used it. Ooh. But it's double spending. That is double spending. It is digital money. Yes, oh. I have it, but you have it as already. Oh. That's why I need M-Pesa, so that oh. M-Pesa, when you send me that money, uh -huh. M-Pesa deducts it from your from account. my account. And, and now puts, puts it in, it in my in account. Your account. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. so no, you don't have it to double spend it. Yeah. But without, if we remove M-Pesa, I can't trust you. Oh. Yes. So blockchain is coming to play the role of M-Pesa. The role of this intermediary, mm -hmm. whether in any institution, think of any institution you can think of, yeah. there is an in, uh, intermediary, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. that plays the role of enforcing or ensuring that there is trust mm -hmm. in transactions, there right. is trust in communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so blockchain, mm -hmm. in a technical term, is distributed ledger technology. Distributed ledger, ledger technology. technology. Right now, Many companies, mm -hmm. or globally, we have been using for the last decade and over, we've been using centralized ledgers, whereby you have an accountant who keeps the records. Mm -hmm. This amount has been spent, this amount has been received. Mm -hmm. Yes, but then it can decide, and we know cases where yeah. <laughs> accountants messed up sure, with companies. Sure, sure. Yes, yeah. so the accountant, being a central authority, can decide, let me delete this one from the computer. Nobody will know. Nobody will know. Sometimes it even slips the attention of auditors. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And maybe 10 years later, you realize this company has been making losses, mm -hmm. but reporting mm -hmm. profits. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you put a blockchain in there as the central, as the, um, as, the, as the authority, or let me say as the technology bridging this gap of trust, then... <coughs> We are not worried about what the accountant will do. Mm -hmm. We're not worried because blockchain distributes authority. Uh -huh. It uses what we call nodes. nodes. Nodes, just take it for, for example, mm -hmm. the accountant now. Assume now we have maybe 100 accountants all spread. Right. Uh -huh. And all of them, for any transaction to happen, all of them have to approve oh. this transaction. All of them have to approve. They don't know one another. <laughs> you don't know which accountant which is accountant. it where, which yeah. you don't know one another. Yeah. But all of them have you to may approve. know maybe five, mm -hmm. you may know ten, oh. but all of them have to approve. So then if you maybe delete and say that um, a transaction that had happened and then you say, Let us remove this transaction. This transaction perhaps is reducing the value of our company. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a transaction such as maybe there was a theft. Mm -hmm or uh, there was fire that reduced the value of a building, yes. you can decide, let us eliminate this transaction mm -hmm. with the accountant. But then other accountants, other accountants will, will not approve of it. Definitely. 
Yes, so you can't stand alone as a central authority. I get it. That's the difference. Now, in a more practical way, I would like you to maybe pick an example because when I see the book is talking about, you know, governance, it's talking about banking, insurance, healthcare. Let's take for instance how do, does bit, how does this blockchain solve the problem in healthcare? In healthcare, uh, in my book, I have covered a number of uses yes. of blockchain in healthcare, mm -hmm. but I will pick one which I think is the most important, and that is supply chain. All right. Supply chain, the use of blockchain in supply chain is the number one most use, or is going to be the most used use case. Okay across industries, right. because there's no industry that does not have a supply chain aspect of it. Sure. Yes, so when you look at supply chain in healthcare, pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. where do we get our, ma oh, our, drugs. Yeah, our drugs? Yeah. Yes, many of them you'll see uh, made in India. Mm -hmm. They choose some of these uh, countries that are known for health, mm -hmm. but are you sure it's made in, India? made in India? Especially look at capsules. When you're swallowing a capsule, are you sure inside there is medicine, medicine. or there is sawdust? <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? <laughs> we just take it. We I just mean, take it. We got it from the pharmacy or from the house. Perhaps because it, it, it can play a role like a placebo. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you think it is, uh, yeah, 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 it yeah, is yeah, medicine and, you, and <laughs> you get well. You yeah. think that maybe sure. you really took medicine. Mm. But the truth is there's a lot of fake drugs in the market right yes, now. Yes, which is a huge problem. I saw which is a huge yeah. problem. The government is really cracking it. Yes. Up. And across the world, many of them manufactured in China mm -hmm. and branded as made in India. All right. Yes, then distributed across supply chains into Africa, into Asia, into Europe, and the US. Mm -hmm. So you, when you go to the pharmacy mm -hmm. to buy medicine, mm -hmm. you just tell the, pharma the pharmacist what your problem is, or you go with a prescription, yes. and they give you, they the, give drugs. you the drugs. Yeah. It has never crossed your mind that this is a fake drug. It will hardly ever cross your mind. Why? Because it is difficult to even authenticate. It is difficult to, I mean, how do you look at Panadol and say oh, this, this is, is fake, or fake or Panadol or this is fake <laughs> paracetamol, paracetamol. Yeah. How, how do you yeah. gauge that? It, it's difficult. It's difficult. Using bare eyes, yes. yes. But then supply chain, using blockchain, can help us trace medicine mm -hmm. from the verifiable manufacturer, oh, right. the authentic manufacturer, mm -hmm. then we can trace this drug mm -hmm. from the manufacturer to the, to the distribution, distribution. Mm -hmm. to the stores right. until it reaches the user, All right. the patient. Oh. Yes. We can have, uh, and there are already uh, uh, systems that are available in the blockchain space okay, right. that can help pharmacists, that can help uh, governments mm -hmm. to enforce this, to help trace <coughs> drugs mm -hmm. from the manufacturer to the time it reaches. So taking the theory of those <coughs> 100 accountants who are to approve this one transaction to happen, I now clearly understand how it works also now in this industry now, as you mentioned about yes. the, you know, the steps with which it takes the drug, for the drugs to come from the manufacturer to the user. Yes. Another quick problem, because my director is on my case now, our time is almost up. Issues of governance, how then, <laughs> how I'm really interested, maybe in two minutes, I would like yes. to hear from you, how do we solve this problem when it comes to voting or elections? Yes, it, it, it's good you've already mentioned voting and, mm -hmm. and elections, mm -hmm. because um, I've mentioned in my book mm -hmm. that this is not just an issue for Africa alone. Mm -hmm. Many times Africa have been in the limelight or in the, whatever, as, as the only mm -hmm. continent yeah. facing an issue with elections. Yes. But that's not the truth. Election we've rigging. Seen, we've seen <laughs> the U.S. having issues as well. Yeah. We've seen other countries having issues it's as well. It's unfortunate the international media does not speak much about that. Yes, mm -hmm. but Africa is much. But that aside, yes. voting mm -hmm. is about democracy. Yes. Yes. So that every person has one vote mm -hmm. and has that power to only cast, cast one, vote. one vote. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then we've seen issues where or cases in the past in Kenya, mm -hmm. in other countries in Africa, mm -hmm. whereby there have been um, uh, cases where it, it is said or it is uh, purported, it's purported <laughs> that uh, ah, there were votes mm -hmm. 
that were not registered, mm. uh, dead voters or, voted. Or more or, votes than or more registered, votes than voters. registered. Uh -huh. yes. Mm. So you look at such cases, it is because our central body mm. governing the elections sometimes are compromised. Mm. And when they are compromised, it is difficult to know whether or not. Yes. They can say, no, we are not compromised. But you, you won't be able to really authenticate. To well. authenticate, yes. Yes. Yeah. So when blo blockchain coming in, there's something called smart contracts, okay. which is a big issue. And uh, the, mm -hmm. the use case that I explained in health, yes. smart contracts will be, mm -hmm. used, will be used in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yes. So smart contracts in elections and voting, mm -hmm. These are already an example, a real use case, uh, a real example that has happened already right. in uh, uh, Sierra Leone, okay. where a company called Agora Blockchain. All right. Agora Blockchain helped Sierra Leone to conduct the first presidential election right. on the blockchain. Oh. Yes. Oh, the recent elections? Yes. Ah. Yes, so they didn't ge not generate the general election, yeah. but just the presidential election the was. The presidential election yes. alone, yes. So, that one tells us that this is something possible. Mm -hmm. This is something possible. Elections, for them to be successful, mm -hmm. free and fair, mm -hmm. democratically held, there has to be trust. Sure. Yes. Sure. And as I've mentioned in my book, mm -hmm. blockchain is a trust machine because it eliminates the aspect of centralization. Mm -hmm. It right. decentralizes, yeah. decentralizes authority. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. It decentralizes and distributes this to nodes. All right. Then there's also an aspect of, of course, there's a lot to it. There's a private blockchain whereby not everybody now can just can see access. the data or add mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, Timothy, this is something that can be used. Yes. This is something that is applicable, it's applicable in industries. Yeah. It's, yes. It sounds very practical. Now, maybe before we end that, you know, uh, you've written the book and uh, you are informing me that uh, you are launching the book. Yeah, the book. When the book, and where is the launch taking place? The book will be launched at Strathmore University, All right? Business School, uh -huh. this twenty eighth of November, All right? From two p.m. Uh -huh. Yes, and we have a number of guests coming. Okay. We have the chief guest, uh, Professor Bitange Demo. Oh, yes, and uh, other variety of guests uh -huh. coming to discuss. There will be a panel discussion right. to look at the adoption, the timelines and adoption of blockchain in Africa. All right. Yes, how, how is this thing solving our issues? Our issues, yeah. And what is the timeline? What, what time do we have to give it okay. for us to see real change? All right. Yes. So that's interesting. I believe, God willing, I really want to be there and maybe get to listen also from the other panelists what they'll be saying about the whole idea. But also, I would also like to hear some comments about the book for those who will have read the book, of course. Yes. Maybe finally, as we finish, your parting shot, I would like you to <coughs> just tell us, in maybe in a minute and a half, where do you see the future of blockchain in Kenya? In Kenya. Bearing in mind that Kenya is one of the countries that actually are very, are always almost first in Africa to adopt to new technologies and new ways of doing things? Uh, I would start that <coughs> answering that question by mentioning that uh, as of now, mm -hmm. the Kenya Blockchain and their task force mm -hmm. have already released their report. All right. Yes, their report about blockchain adoption in Kenya. All right. Yes, where it will be used and how they plan to use it. Mm -hmm. And that shows you the speed with which our government is moving. All right. Yes. Okay. We've seen uh, public figures come out, mm -hmm. the Capital Markets Authority, yes. we've seen uh, the Central Bank, mm -hmm. we've seen uh, uh, the Election Authority, yeah. the, chairman the Chairman of yeah. the IEBC. Mm -hmm. We've seen them mention their intentions to use blockchain mm -hmm. in their various institutions. All right. And this is not something that you see easily in many of the African countries. So I think that Kenya we are going to really adopt this fast. I expect to see a lot of activity in the next one to two years. So Not 20, to mention five 2022, years. 2022, we, we could possibly go to the ballot <laughs> with the support of uh, <laughs> yes, yes. this oh. technology, hopefully. Hopefully, uh -huh. hopefully, yes. Uh -huh. But there is a challenge. And I've covered these challenges in my book. Yeah. The number one challenge is we need a variety of developers. All right. 
Africa, as of now, we don't have adequate developers, right. adequate educators, okay. and I've also covered that in opportunities okay. in the blockchain right. for the youth and for people in, 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 in technology. Right. There are opportunities. Mm -hmm. IBC, for us to use blockchain, they need adequate or enough developers. Mm -hmm. They need enough educators who understand blockchain, right. yes, mm -hmm. for this adoption to be possible. Right now, right now mm -hmm. it may just be a talk, okay. and it may just be a wish. All right. But uh, there are chances. We still have like three years. All right. I mean, I can't, I don't know. Uh -huh. In technology oh, world, yeah, three years is a lot. Very fast, yeah. Three years is a lot, very yes. Very and I don't know, I can't tell what will happen in 2022. Mm -hmm. I'm change. just believing. Mm -hmm. That's why we are pushing through books mm -hmm. for people to understand it mm -hmm. and help in adoption. Maybe just you'll bear with me and also my director will bear with me. Something I just want to throw at you. Our higher learning institutions, are they also making the same noise on the same? Are they, open up, up, are they opening up opportunities for young people to actually learn more and get to get you know, that knowledge about how these things work? So that, like you're saying, we have you know, a, a huge deficit. Yes. Yeah. Do you, are, are learning institutions in Kenya picking up this, especially? Um, not quite, mm -hmm. not quite fast as I would as expect would. it, okay. uh, because learning institutions, these are, they have the biggest research labs, right. I would say, because they have students mm -hmm. ready to research and ready to learn. Mm -hmm. But Kenya, many learning institutions, pr both private and public, have not taken the opportunity quite fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we can see Strathmore University, yes. There have been many events, many activities in Stratford right. University. Currently, there is an event that is running by BitHub Africa, All right. teaching people on blockchain. On blockchain. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is an opportunity that the youth sure. could, could run into. Sure. The issue mm -hmm. why most universities have not started programs on blockchain mm -hmm. is because they still lack content. Right. They still lack, uh, they've not developed curricula. curricula. They've not developed uh, good syllabuses that could cover this well. Yeah, but... Uh, I mean, we will be working with the University of Nairobi. I've engaged uh, the D Dean School of Business, University of Nairobi, mm -hmm. and there will be programs coming up even through the University of Nairobi mm -hmm. to help people, more people learn blockchain. Mm -hmm. And we hope in the next one year, mm -hmm. two years, two years. there could be yeah. more bigger projects. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Benjamin Arunda, the author of Understanding the Blockchain. He is also the ambassador of Dash Kenya. And thank you very much also viewer for joining us today on this episode of The People Show. As always, if you have any comments, suggestions, or opinion, you can send us an email on info at gbskenya.com or you can drop us a short message on 21144. 21144 is the number. My name is Timothy Omondi. Thank you very much. Let's meet again same time, same place. Bye bye for now. Thank you very much, Safo, for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>